I'm Graham Bacon. I'm down on the Warrenora River about 15 miles south of Sydney and I live on the hill which is on the right hand side of your screen and I want to talk to you about the book of Revelation. It's the last chapter, the last book of the Bible, 22 chapters written by John on the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea with information provided in a visionary method by the Lord Jesus Christ around about AD 90. Now the prophecy really begins in chapter 6. Chapter 1 is about the qualifications of the Lord Jesus Christ without peer to be able to give the prophecy. Chapters 2 and 3 are about seven representative ecclesias and it describes the conditions of the ecclesias in John's day which is not very good. Now I'm going to talk about um, history because where we stand in the 21st century most of the prophecy of Revelation is for us history but it was written as a prophecy I just want you to understand that. Now the book of Revelation is a follow-on from the book of Daniel. Daniel described events up to the Roman Empire in his time. He didn't know anything about a Roman Empire. The book of Revelation takes up the story uh, from Daniel's time and to, together they make up 2600 years of history which is a remarkable thing. And I want to go back and inside and have a look at uh, a couple of uh, biblical passages to show the connection between Daniel and Revelation. This is the famous metal man of Daniel chapter 2 dreamed by Nebuchadnezzar who's asleep down at the bottom left hand side. Now Daniel knew uh, the, uh, of the Babylonian Empire, he knew of the Medes and Persians which is the next metal down, he knew of the Greek Empire but nobody in Daniel's day knew anything much about Rome, Rome was just a village and down here it was quite inappropriate for anybody in uh, um, the time of Daniel to say anything about the Roman Empire. So when Daniel asked the question about what was going to happen to that fourth empire, he was told to seal up the book. And these are the verses that make the appropriate connection between Daniel and Revelation. In Daniel chapter 12, Daniel is told to shut up the words and to seal the book. Now in Revelation chapter 5, they are searching for somebody appropriate to open the seals. Do not weep, behold the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals placed there so long ago. And so the connection between Daniel and Revelation is made in continuing a history of the world in prospect in a wonderful connection of 2,600 years. Now here is a list of six purposes of the book of Revelation and I'm sure you'll be able to add to the list. To reveal the future of Christianity to believers, uh, to add to Daniel giving 2,600 plus years of prophecy which we've just talked about, to show God's involvement in coming events and that these things are not happening by accident but God is directly involved in a lot of things that were going to happen. To show the progression of 18 major events in three distinct areas of history. To warn the audience to repent and of the coming divine punishments and to balance that to provide frequent visions of kingdom glory. Now here's a colour coding for the 22 chapters of the book of Revelation. The green chapters 1, 10 and 15 are introductions to the sections which follow those chapters. The orange colour to here and these elongated ones are historical circumstances regarding the very early church plus 
in here, 1,800 years of historical circumstances concerning the seals, the trumpets and the bowls, and we'll talk about that a little later. The maroon colour are kingdom chapters. The black ones here go back and have a look at the whole historical sequence from another point of view. The dark blue chapters is the chapter about the three beasts. The light blue are chapters about our future. So in those 22 chapters are covered the history and the circumstances of the church from AD 90 to 2000 plus, as well as wonderful views of what the kingdom will be like. Chapters 2 and 3 provide an assessment of the condition of seven representative ecclesias of that day, of John's day. And I've given them a rating out of 10. Ephesus was just over halfway. They were given a fair assessment, but they had amongst them the Nicolaitans. Smyrna was 100% commended. Pergamos was very similar to Ephesus. It had a fair assessment as well, but it had amongst them the Balaam people. Thyatira was fair, but there was Jezebel amongst them. Sardis, there was very little to commend Sardis. They were just told to hold fast and repent. Philadelphia was another one that had a 100% commendation. And Laodicea was the bottom of the table. They were neither hot nor cold, and unless they repented, God would spew them out of his mouth. Before we go to the 18 major world events that God wants us to take special notice of, in chapter 6, 8, 9 and 16, and they are the seals, the trumpets and the bowls, there's a feature of chapter 7 that I want to make a remark about. In verses 5 to 8, each of the 12 tribes of Israel is numbered in having 12,000 going into the multitude in the kingdom. It's limited to a special number and, if you like, it's a descriptive of a remnant of Israel in the kingdom. Now in verse 9, there is a different set of circumstances. Behold a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, tribes, peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb. This is those who go forward into the kingdom apart from the Jewish people out of the tribes of Israel. Now there's a distinction made between the Jews of Israel who are limited and an unlimited number which are non-Jewish people which go forward into the kingdom. And that's very important. In Matthew chapter 19, the disciples are wondering where they stand in relationship to the kingdom. And it's Peter who raises the subject in verse 27. And Peter answered and said unto him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? And so Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And here in Revelation chapter 7, we have each of those twelve tribes listed, and each of them has a symbolic 12,000 number, who uh, gain entrance into the kingdom and they have a special administration, it seems to me, in the kingdom. Not only that, in the relationship of the Jewish people to the kingdom, there are some hints in the Old Testament that, that special things happen to them. In Zechariah chapter 12 at verse 10, 
The Spirit is poured out upon Israel before they repent. Then they repent when the Spirit's poured out upon them and, ex and recognize Jesus whom they have pierced. And in Zechariah chapter 8 and at verse 23, you'll find ten men take hold of the clothing of a Jew and they say, we will go with you because we have heard that God is with you. And so there is Jewish people out there collecting ten persons per Jew. Bring them and show them the kingdom. So there seems to me to be a special relationship with special tasks that the Jewish people have and a special administration in the kingdom. The reason why God provided timelines like this was that for every generation along here, there was, if there was one person in that generation who could understand the timelines, they could tell their generation where they stood in the progress of God's work on the earth towards the kingdom. For example, if the generation in 632 could see the Arabs invading Europe, then they would know that they were roughly halfway through God's work towards the kingdom. Sir Isaac Newton was a, a man who used timelines. He lived in uh, around about here, about 1700, shortly after. And he worked out by timelines that it would be 350 years from his time until Jerusalem was freed by the hand of the oppressor in 1967. He forecast that date. Now that was the six day war in which Jerusalem was freed from the hands uh, of uh, the Turks. Or rather the hands of the Arabs. Now this is a simplified illustration and it has one drawback because it's not terribly accurate. It divides the times into very precise pieces of history, but that's not how history works. And what I want to do is to show you a way of, so that we can be a little bit more accurate about how the historical purposes were unfolding. Now these are blocks of time representing the periods over which the six seals took place. And you'll find that some of them are overlapping or even incorporated in the situation in which this period of time went on for quite a while. This is a more accurate way of uh, illustrating how the time periods associated with the seals occur according to historical record. Now you'll see that the angel says to John, come and see. And he takes him as if it was to a window, looking out on a series of events that was going to happen as the seals were broken. Now this is in direct relationship to what was happening with, for example, the bowls. And when we come to the bowls, you'll find that the angels are pouring out the bowls of wrath upon the earth, the wrath of God upon the earth. And this is a contrast to this situation. Now, it seems to me that what's being said here is that God is not having any major direct involvement with what was happening to the decline of the Roman Empire, that God didn't need to get involved, that it was declining of its own accord. In other words, it was self-destruction. Now the first seal is of a white horse in period 90 to 180 AD. And the horse is ridden by a rider who has a bow but no arrows. In other words, he's not aggressive. It was a time of peace and of happiness and it was a time in which the bow shot forth the gospel. Gibbon says that this was the happiest period of time in the Holy Roman Empire, sorry, in the Roman Empire, which meant that you had good communications, you had postal services, you had an administration that could be relied upon, you had a good police system, court system, law system, so that it was ideal for the gospel to spread very rapidly. Hence, it was a white horse. Now the second seal was broken, which John saw, and he saw a red horse. 
And this was a period of time from 180 to about 306 in which there was a whole lot of bloodshed and assassinations and violence going on in the Roman Empire. You had senators being assassinated in the Senate. Can you imagine people being assassinated in the White House in America every year, one a year, and in uh, the parliaments in Britain or Australia where you've got a succession of people being assassinated. That was what was happening in the Roman Empire over 30 years. Gibbon says uh, that 28 emperors uh, were on the throne but only one of them died peacefully in bed. The rest died violently or died of plague or were expelled and the whole empire was in chaos. Now the third seal was broken and here we've got a black horse and the rider is carrying a set of balances measuring out food and it was food rationing. The administration was collapsing and that's because of what was happening to the empress. There was no decent administration of the kingdom and so food was scarce and then John saw when the fourth seal was broken a sickly colored horse whose name was death and of course that follows on with the food rationing people uh, were dying of disease and starvation Gibbon says 5,000 people a day were dying in Rome and so you come to that period of time by uh, 268 uh, when a little change took place and you've got some very strong emperors then came on the throne and in this period of time they ruled with a rod of iron and so when the fifth seal was broken John saw souls under the altar a persecution of the Christians and it says in that verse in chapter 6 that the souls cried to the Lord and said how long O Lord and the answer was you must wait until the rest of those who will suffer persecution will join your number. And they would hardly imagine that that would be another 1,500 years because that's about how long the persecution of the Christians lasted in the Holy Roman Empire that was to come. In around about the late 1800s, Robert Roberts gave a lecture in the Birmingham Town Hall and he quoted a French historian who said that in 1500 years the Holy Roman Empire killed 50 million people and a vast majority of those were people who objected to the way the, 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 the Catholic Church was carrying on and that their false beliefs and they objected to it. It's an astounding number, the souls under the altar. And then the sixth seal was broken and John saw earthquakes and violence and upheavals and that was the barbarians starting to come into the empire to threaten it and folk were afraid, the verse says, people were afraid. And the empire also was split into west and east and that's when Constantine took off the uh, capital of the empire to Constantinople. And so here's the decline of the Roman Empire starting in a very rapid fashion. And they are what the seals were about. Now these are six blocks of time associated with the blowing of the trumpets over a long period of world history from 400 AD to into um, the 20th century. You'll notice that the orange line represents the Eastern Roman Empire. Although the Western Roman Empire had collapsed, the Eastern Roman Empire still survived until 1453. Now, the, there's a special thing about the uh, assembly of the angels and blowing the trumpet. And I want to read to you from Revelation chapter 8, beginning at verse 5. And then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. 
Now these angels had coals of fire and they were thrown on the earth causing these things to happen. And these are six events that God wanted us to mark particularly in this long period of time. And God was involved in bringing them about. And that's because the coals were thrown on the earth by the angel. And that's in contrast to what happened early on. What happened in the fall of the Roman Empire was things which were shortly to come to pass, uh, as chapter 1 says. And now we're moving into longer periods of time. Now John heard the first trumpet blown, and the angels threw coals of fire on the land. And these are the circumstances that was happening in the land in uh, round about Italy in the Alps, where there were many cross-border raids by the barbarians. They finally captured Rome. They displaced the last Roman Empire, emperor. He finished in 476 AD. The fall of the West Roman Empire and the Lombards took over Rome. You know that there's parts of Italy called Lombardy, so it goes right back to these barbarian times. And that was the first trumpet. Now the second trumpet was blown and the angels cast their coals on the sea. And this prefigured the arrival of the Vandals. Now the Vandals came from Scandinavia and they were very good seamen. And they came right down the west coast of Europe. They looted all the uh, places that were on the west coast on the way down of Europe. They even sailed up the Seine River and looted Paris, would you believe? They then continued down past Spain, went through Gibraltar and came and took over the West Mediterranean Sea. So the Roman part of the empire had collapsed and the Vandals had arrived in the sea. Now that was all organised by God because these angels were throwing these coals down on the earth to cause these things to happen, which is in contrast to what was happening earlier on. Now the third trumpet was blown and John saw that the coals were thrown on the rivers and the springs. And this was symbolic of the arrival of Attila and the Huns. They invaded the Alps and they were very brutal people so far as the barbarians were concerned. They withdrew after a short period of time, the Huns, and they finally settled in Hungary. And that's why it's called that. Now the fourth trumpet was sounded and John saw that the sun and the moon and the stars were darkened. And this is the arrival of the Dark Ages. We even call it the Dark Ages in this, in this period of time. The barbarians had taken over and they were uncultured people, very rough people. And the Arabs started to suppress Europe. And so it was the Dark Ages. Now the fifth angel sounded with the fifth trumpet and John saw a shooting star and locusts from the abyss. Now the abyss is where the Arabs came from. Now, people didn't know anything much about Arabia and so it was just classed as the abyss. And these people arrived from the abyss. And of course 632 Muhammad uh, starting to take over and the uh, Arabian Arabs were in Europe until 1500. They were thrown out of Spain in 1492 and they were a plague upon Europe as locusts from the abyss for a great length of time. And God was instrumental in making sure that they arrived and did what they did. And finally the sixth angel was sounded and John saw four winds blowing across the Euphrates from east to west. And these were the Asian people, the Asian hordes who arrived. They were the Mongols and the Tatars and Genghis Khan and the Turks arrived 1600 and they stayed until 1917 in the Holy Land. And these were all organised by God for a reason. And the reason is they did not repent. 
Now I want to say a little bit about that. So why did God organise, orchestrate, all these problems in Europe over this long period of time? There were wars and plagues, problems, invasions, coming in upon people all the time. And quite a lot of the time they were um, afraid of what was happening. We don't have to look far in Revelation to find out why God was uh, doing these kinds of things. So I want to read you a little bit out of Revelation chapter 9. By these three plagues, at verse 18, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. That was about the Arab invasions of Europe. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk, and they did not repent of their murders and of their sorceries or of their sexual immorality or of their thefts. Now the church was so badly behaved in Europe over this long period of time, beginning way back there in AD 90 with those seven representative churches, right through to the present time where it had grown worse and worse. And so God was trying to get them to change their evil ways and their improper beliefs and in trying to get them to repent of their evils and change their ways, but they would not. Now, that kind of thing continued right to the end of the historical period until God brought about the pouring out of the bowls, which was his anger, poured out upon uh, Europe. And in Revelation chapter 16, there is just this little reference again to that kind of thing. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and power was given him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who had power over these plagues and they did not repent and give him glory. And that's what the church was designed for, the repentance from evil change of ways and to give him glory but they would not no matter what God did to try and get them back on the path they would not I'm sitting in our garden surrounded with my wife and its beautiful flowering pots and you'll notice that uh, I had a BCC removed from my nose and that's a skin graft that you're looking at so now we're going to have another look at uh, the pouring out of the bowls. Now these are the first two verses of Revelation chapter 16, which is about the pouring out of the bowls. And I've highlighted there in that pinky colour the important details, which is the background to what was happening with the bowls. And I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. Now, there's no question about what uh, these bowls represented. It was God's working in the earth because he was so angry with uh, what was happening with the church in Europe. And so the first angel went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon particular people, the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Now this is where we come across the beast and his image and we're going to talk about that in detail shortly. But I just want to point out that the, <clears throat> the beast is that political power in Europe that had been going for such a long time and developed into the Holy Roman Empire, which was behind the church, backed up the church with all the terrible things that the church was doing. So this first bowl was poured out upon a particular people who supported 
uh, the Roman Catholic Church and what it was doing. Now, these are the blocks of time concerned with the pouring out of the bowls. But you'll notice the green line that goes across. Coming from the previous set of um, circumstances, which that's the trumpets being blown and the Turks arriving in Europe and they lasted right through this period right up to 1917 when they were thrown out of uh, the Holy Land. But I want to say this about those first two verses of Revelation chapter 16. It is an insight into the mind of God. He was trying to get Europe to repent and change its ways and he was going now to take drastic action notice how from the trumpets to these bowls that God has now got angry and the temperature has been raised and as history goes on and nothing happens God is getting more angry so this set of circumstances now is the, the frantic activity that God was involved in in just over a short period of time and uh, I think it's uh, applicable particularly to the period of the French Revolution. We got to the 1780s and so now the, the first bowl is poured out and it's poured out uh, on those with the mark of the beast and that is the Catholics in Europe particularly centered in France it starts in France which of course is the daughter of the church now, 1789 was the beginning of the French Revolution and it went through to 1871 a long period of time the second bowl was poured out on the sea and Britain ruled the waves. France lost control of the colonies that she had overseas because Britain ruled the sea. And Louisiana was a very huge area in south of the United States around the 1800 mark. But the French couldn't get there because Britain ruled the sea. And so France, in the end, sold the colony of Louisiana, which was about a third of the bottom, bottom bit of the United States. Napoleon sold that to the United States of America in 1804 for 15 million ducats, which um, is uh, quite a big sum of money. So America bought from France that great portion of uh, of course Lou, Louisiana is much smaller these days in the United States but then it was about one third of the United States which was bought for 15 million ducats now the third bowl was poured out on the rivers 1795 to 1799 France the French Republic waged war on her neighbors partially successful Part of that was run by Napoleon. He was over there in Egypt as well. He came back in 1799. And the power of the sun was the fourth bowl to scorch men with fire. Napoleon's rule was imposed on Europe from 1799 to 1812. Now the fact was that the power of the Catholic Church was completely broken. The church had been closed down and the uh, clerics were all sacked but napoleon found that he had no moral force in france so he re-established the church because of its moral value but he employed all the the uh, priests and they became state servants and napoleon had complete control of what the catholic church was going to do no more could they torture people and um, uh, and kill people uh, from the time when napoleon ran the church except in spain spain was one of those places where the inquisition was kept going until uh, into the 1900s now the fifth bowl was poured out on the throne of the beast 
And the Catholic Church, as I said, was forced to act less violently, and that's uh, applicable today. The Catholic Church now deceives people, but it can't treat people with violence. And the sixth bowl is the non-European one. This one was the drying up of the river Euphrates. This is terribly important because it freed the Holy Land for the Jews to go back. So it has a place in the bowls uh, of God's wrath being poured out and uh, God had had enough of the Turks and it was time for his people to come back to the land. An interesting period, which a lot of things happening in a short period of time because God was very angry. Now, I want to ask you this. Do you think that the French Revolution was a good thing or a bad thing? The French Revolution has a bad press almost universally. I don't know anybody who assesses that the French Revolution was a good thing, but it was God's work. We're going to say God uh, was doing a bad thing. It was his judgments on a on a Europe that deserved the judgments. And I think the breaking of the power of the Catholic Church was one of those big advantages that came out of the French Revolution. And here's a group of people, ordinary people, who want to read and study their Bibles, but the church forbade them from doing it, and the only safe place to do it is out in the middle of the river in a boat where you can see your enemies coming and hide the Bibles. Now, there's no liberty there. What is the matter with the French Revolution, liberty, equality and fraternity? They're all good Bible qualifications. Liberty for worship in Christ. There's whole chapters in the Bible about that. Equality and fraternity are all things that are practiced by good Christians. There's nothing wrong with it. But you've got people who say that the French Revolution was a bad thing because of verse 13 in chapter 16. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And people say that was the problem with liberty equality and fraternity uh, and they're the three things that are unclean spirits now i think that it's the what developments later on that came out of the french revolution not the french revolution itself there was nationalism and nations wanted to fight each other nationalism came later from the french revolution that's where the unclean spirits are but not in the french revolution in my view Here's another picture out of Alan Eyre's book, The Protesters, and it's the burning of the heretics, or so-called heretics. The fire is so hot they had to put them on a ladder so as that the people operating the fire didn't get too close. You'll see on the left-hand side where that red arrow is that there is the, just the remains of a ladder and a head of a person who's just been finished bur being burnt. In the background is the church running the whole show. That's what the French Revolution was about. That's what liberty, fraternity and equality were all about. Get rid of this kind of thing. And it was a good thing. Having completed the timeline of the Revelation, we now turn to the three chapters which go back over that period of time to look at it from three different points of view. And here in Revelation chapter 11, we're looking at it from the point of view of two witnesses. Now this is a chapter that tells the believers that no matter how bad, dark, horrible things were in Europe, that the truth would still be witnessed to by two witnesses. Now you can see that the two witnesses are two olive trees and two lampstands. And of course the lamp stands, the flames that are burning there is the, the truth. And the two olive trees and the lamp stands symbols come from Zechariah chapter 4. So when you read Zechariah chapter 4, he asks, what is, this, is the meaning of the two olive trees? And this is the angel's answer. These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. So it seems to me that perhaps... These two witnesses 
are these two anointed ones, whoever they may be. They may be angels working behind the scenes. They may be personalities um, passed from one to the other. People who go forward in the power and strength of Moses and Elijah who are able to do these kinds of things. Now they witnessed for 1260 days and down here when their testimony was finished the beast from the abyss kills the witnessing and their dead bodies lie in the street three and a half days and their buried, buried, bodies were not buried and the earth rejoiced because of the two prophets had tormented them. And it seems to me that what we are talking about here is a witnessing that started way back shortly after the end of the uh, Roman Empire, lasted for 1260 days, and then the witnessing was virtually wiped out by the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day in 1572. Now, the Holy Roman Empire struck a medal because of what they saw as a great victory when 82,000 people were killed in one day. And the earth people rejoiced because they had that medal to be uh, pleased about. Now it says that after three and a half days, God breath resurrected them and great fear fell on their enemies. And then they were caught up into heavenly places in earthly kingdoms, a great earthquake, Tenth of the city fell, 7,000 people were killed. This is all to do with the end of the power of the Catholic Church when the Protestants were able to get control of, um, of the empire and the church through the work of Napoleon. But why did their witnessing finish um, after 1260 years in the year 1572, if our interpretation is correct. Well, the thing is that the Protestant uh, Reformation was a, were arriving in Europe and the witnessing passed to a different group of people. The witnessing continued, but it continued in a different form. Now we are told that the second woe is past and the third woe is coming. And it seems to me that the only other place in Revelation where that word woe occurs is in the next chapter of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12. In my view, this chapter is about the Jewish nation, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the destiny of the Jewish people throughout the long history of Europe after their scattering in AD 70. Now the woman has got the sun, moon and stars on her head. These were the symbols that Joseph dreamed of way back in the time of uh, Jacob and his 12 sons. Now the Jewish people struggled to bring forth a situation in which the Lord Jesus Christ could be born. Eventually he was. The sign of the fiery red dragon with seven heads and ten horns is the Roman officials which tried to uh, prevent uh, Jesus being able to continue to his ministry. Of course you remember that Herod killed all the babies under the age of two years but Jesus was safe in Egypt. Now Israel bore a male child of Mary to rule all nations with a rod of iron and the child was caught up to God and his throne. Now you'll see that this is a description of the Lord Jesus Christ later on in Revelation. There's no mistake about that. And Jesus was caught up to God and his throne. Very specific. Now the more traditional interpretation is that the child was Constantine but Constantine was a very violent and wicked man he killed his son and he killed his wife thinking she was unfaithful to him 
Furthermore, he wasn't baptised until his deathbed, and one presumes that he thought that he would be able to sin until the very last moment and then not be accounted for them, have them washed away in baptism. But later on in this chapter, you read these remarks. Verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. This chapter is about the Lord Jesus Christ and the destiny of his Jewish people. Now the woman fled into the wilderness, a place prepared by God for a long period of time. What a good description of Europe in those days when the Jews were scattered and finally wound up, most of them in Europe. And then the dragon was cast out of heaven. Notice that here's the word heaven, but the word heaven is not here. This is the heavens of the earth, the ruling places on the earth. The dragon was cast out of the ruling places on the earth because other people took over. He persecuted the woman who fled to her safe place. And then the dragon sent a flood after her, but the earth swallowed her up. He then made war on her offspring. And of course, you can see how that uh, the Jews were taken to a safe place. They have wound up in uh, England, America and uh, Eastern Europe. And then he made war on her offspring, which were the Christians who came out of the Jewish tradition. Now, I want to make an important observation about the treatment of prophecy. Some people say to me that you can't be dogmatic about the fulfilment of prophecy until uh, the events come to pass. But that's not true. There are prophecies in the Bible about which we can be dogmatic about. And they are things like that Jesus will return to the earth, that there will be a resurrection, that there will be judgment, that Jesus will reign from Jerusalem. There are prophecies which are in simple language, easy to understand, repeated several times, and we can be dogmatic about those prophecies. And there are others as well. Take, for example, Daniel. And he was <coughs> the four metals in the metal man. We were told what three of them are, and it's not difficult to work out what the fourth one is, that it was Rome. So there are prophecies that you can be dogmatic about. But there are prophecies that you can't be dogmatic about, that there's not enough information, or it's not clear what the uh, meaning is, or that there are alternative explanations, and you have to make a choice, and when you make a choice, you can't be dogmatic about it. So you have to be discretionary about how you treat prophecy. And the difficulty is that there are some people once they get in their mind what their understanding of that prophecy is, no matter what kind of prophecy it is, that they will be dogmatic about it, and that's a big mistake. Now, there are certain languages that can be used in explaining what prophecies are about to give the audience an understanding that you're not being dogmatic. You can say, it seems to me, or it is possible that, or phrases like that to give the idea that you're not being dogmatic about it and that's a very sensible way to go. And that brings me to something else. Over half a lifetime I've read numerous uncounted articles about prophecy from various writers. I've heard all kinds of talks, I've heard lots of people's ideas about prophecy and over a period of time I have learnt that sometimes I need to change my mind. Now there are some people who seem to think that once they get an idea of prophecy fixed in their mind, that's it. That's got to be the way it is. And they don't, uh, they haven't got the facility to be able to update their attitudes, for example the Arabs being so terribly important in Bible prophecy at the present time. And they make a mistake by giving a, well, sticking to a traditional point of view which is a hundred plus years old 
and doesn't really apply to the present circumstances. That is another mistake. There seems to be widespread agreement as to what these symbols mean. The dragon was uh, symbolic of um, pagan imperial Rome, which Constantine took across to Constantinople and made the eastern leg of the Roman Empire, which lasted to 1453. That's the dragon. The beast represents centres of political power in Western Europe, an example of which was the Holy Roman Empire. And the woman represents a church. If she's in white, she's God's people, which is either the Jews or the believing Christians. And the woman in purple represents the evil church. Now, Revelation chapter 13 is about a dragon in two forms. It's about two beasts and the image or the replica of a beast. Now, why have we got such an array of uh, symbols? Well, this is uh, an illustration of the pagan Roman Empire, which I've labelled Dragon 1A. The thing is that the believers in uh, the Roman Empire had only ever lived in an administration which had one centre, and that was Rome, right there. But it wasn't going to be like that in Europe anymore because there were going to be uh, a range of centres of power and this was the chapter that describes those different centres of power. In 300 AD the Roman Empire was breaking up and Constantine moved the capital from Rome to Constantinople. So the dragon moved across to the east. It was the same dragon but in a slightly different form. In verse 1 John sees a beast arising out of the sea and this represents the very strong Christian influence in Rome from about 300 AD through to about 4 79 in which it only lasted about 150 years and then it went into obscurity in verse 11 john sees a second beast arising out of the land and of course that's uh, the european land mass the franks had moved across from over here in the east they'd moved across into Central Europe there and they had formed a very strong kingdom and around about 770 AD Charlemagne set up his capital at Aachen and that became the power force in Europe for the time so we've got power centers moving around Europe and the beasts are the means by which Revelation 13 is explaining what's happened. In Revelation chapter 13, there is a long description of the wickedness of the first beast and the wickedness again of the second beast. And in verse 14, it says, And he deceived those who dwell on the earth both those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived now the pope down here in rome in obscurity he rome had been invaded by the vandals and all the lands had been taken from the pope he appealed to Charlemagne up here in AD 800 round about that time to come and back him up and restore his uh, territory and Charlemagne did that so the replica of the first beast was recreated down here in the area where the first beast used to be it was a different kind of beast it was these two people were acting in concert together and it became the Holy Roman Empire eventually. 
Uh, but you can see that there are now three power centers. And this is what the message of Revelation 13 was really about. That there was going to be this seesaw uh, prominence of different centers of power. They would uh, wax and wane and that the believers had to be prepared to um, be able to recognize themselves in this time frame that Revelation 13 is talking about. We now come to prophecies in the Revelation which are current and future to our time. In Revelation 17, John is shown the vision of a wicked woman full of names of blasphemy, mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abomination of the earth. And the woman is drunk with the blood of the saints. She's sitting on a scarlet-coloured beast. The beast, we are told, has seven heads and ten horns. So it's the old Roman routine again in its most modern form. We're told in verse 9, Here is the mind which has wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And of course, Rome sits on seven hills or seven mountains. Now in chapter 18, uh, we are told in verse 11 onwards that there are 23 items of trade involved. It's the trading chapter of the Bible. So this beastly woman system is a trading system based in Europe with Rome as its headquarters. Now the European Union started off in 1957 as the Treaty of Rome. There's no question about the fact that we are looking at the present day European Union. Now the destiny of the European Union occurs in verse 14 where the ten kings give power to the beast for one hour and they go and fight the Lord Jesus Christ. These will make war with the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So what we are being told here is the destiny of the European Union going far into the future when the uh, European Union goes and fights the Lord Jesus Christ and of course is defeated. Now the sequel to that is that the ten kings find that they've been defeated and they've been deceived and they turn upon the woman and burn her with fire. And here in this picture on the left hand side you can see Rome burning. However the beast escapes to fight another day. In chapters 19 and 20, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ goes forth with the sword of the word of the Lord in his mouth to subdue the rest of the nations in the world. We find that the beast is captured and the dragon is captured and they are both cast alive into the lake that burns with fire. The last two chapters give wonderful visions of the kingdom of the future and require no explanation from me. So the book of Revelation gives a wonderful insight to what was going to happen in the next 2,000 years.